We've got a tight schedule because the hall we've only been able to get for an hour. But we need to grab it because of the urgency of the, uh, of the situation that we're dealing with. So we're going to have to okay, run sure. through. Yes, excuse me for a second. We're going to have to run through pretty quickly, pretty sharp. Um, questions we would prefer if you held back to the end so that we can get everybody on. We've got some uh, representatives from the Suffolk Greens here to give us some understanding of what's happening in other areas, but it's relevant to us. We've also got Mike Nimney, who's a Liberal Democrat candidate for this area, and he's got some uh, really interesting information about how we've got to where we are now and what we're dealing with. Um, but okay, why are we here? I mean, a lot of you have probably said, well, it's all too bloody late because the estates are being built and nobody's listened to us. Nobody has taken a blind bit of notice of what we've had to say. And that may have been the case, but there may be an opportunity that has presented itself where if you guys want to, you can have a voice and we can collectively have a voice across the region that may have an impact on what's going on around here. Um, what's basically caused this situation is that uh, Michael Goh, who uh, is the uh, secretary, I believe, for the Leveling Up program, whatever that means, um, has also put a letter into the House of Commons in December putting forward, recommending some major changes to the planning framework. Now, those changes, when I read the letter, if I wanted to come up with a letter that described everything that didn't happen with our local plan, it would have probably been that letter from Michael Gove. So, what, we, what we're looking to do, we've got to, we've got to get um, some comments in on the outline planning application for how it way by the 1st of February. So we haven't got a lot of time, but if we get enough of the local community putting in comments, we believe that we can delay the process for making final decisions. And what we can do is during that time, we can gather more resources. There are local groups in other areas that believe you me are having just the same sort of problems that we've had in dealing with East Suffolk Council over the local planning policy. Uh, and they are having a meeting, I believe, on the 4th of February, which I'm going to go to, and some of the CAP Cab members are going to go to, to try and form some kind of uh, consensus to put pressure on East Suffolk to wake the hell up and start listening to the people that they are elected to represent. So there's two things that we need to deal with today. One is how do we comment on this application for Howlett Way? <coughs> two is how do we look at the wider implications of this policy change that's going on at Westminster? And bear in mind that East Suffolk Council generally do whatever Westminster asks them to do, then they ought to listen to what Westminster is now going to be asking them to do. So, um, I just want to quickly run through, because I am on a tight schedule, what did Gove say in his letter to the House of Commons? He said, gentlemen, the process is not working. Planning is not working. How many of you agree with that? Yeah? Some people with their hands not up, you agree it's working? Okay. The local plan for this area was approved and formulated on what they call a top-down formula. Does anybody know what that is? It means Westminster says, you've got to jump this high, and East Suffolk say, I'll do it. They give you a number of houses, and then you have to allocate them and distribute them. And in that scenario, what's happened is that Felixstowe, and I believe Saxmundham, Framlingham, certain areas in this county have been targeted for excessive levels of new housing. But it's not based on the local needs of the area. 
Now, all good planning should start bottom up. Now, guess what Mr. Gove is recommending now in the House of Commons? Bottom up planning. And guess what he goes on to say? The local community must be at the heart of every planning decision. Now, you're the local community. Do you feel, do you feel that you're at the heart of every planning decision that's being made? No, I don't either. The local community must support all developments. Well, do you feel that the local community are supporting all these developments? I wouldn't say some housing, yeah, we've got a problem with that, but the scale and density of what is being done to the Trulies and other areas is beyond all common sense. Now, this one I had to chuckle at. The developments must be beautiful. <laughs> I had to read that a couple of times, to be honest, because I didn't, uh, I didn't quite believe what I was reading, but are these developments beautiful? I mean, they're big, they're vast. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Well, they're beautiful when they come to sell them. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed when they destroyed the poppy field, they called the estate poppy field green, which is the height of irony. But not only that, in the literature from the sales companies, it said, come to the delightfully quiet rural village of Trimley St. Martin. Enjoy the open landscape, the wonderful views. Yet East Suffolk Council had a real problem, if you remember, even agreeing to us being a village because they wanted to unlock all the land around here. So they had to reclassify us with that wonderful name, if you can remember, of being a key service centre. Who remembers that? Do you remember STAG and the local campaigns that went on here saying, hold on a minute, we've been in the doomsday book as a village and now you're telling us we're not a village. But you've got a shop and you've got a pub. So you're, you're, you're bigger than a village. I mean, it, it, it was crazy. But you have to understand that their rationale was to grab the land. And that's what they've done. So, moving swiftly on. <laughs> another, one, another one that makes me chuckle. Developments must not be of a size and scale that dominates the landscape character of the region. <laughs> so how do we feel about that, guys? <laughs> when you look outside your, your houses now, and you drive down the high road and you see all the developments and you see the landscape character disappearing before your very eyes, do you think that what's happening in the current local plan meets these requirements? No. I don't. No. I certainly don't. Oh God, this is even better. There must be adequate infrastructure. <laughs> now I had a quick conversation with one of the planning officers at one of their wonderful drop-in meetings where they sit there and listen to you, don't do anything, and then tick a box. And we said, well, how are you going to deal with the infrastructure? There's 4,000 houses going up in and around Felixstowe. Not one new road. Well, there is a little link road being built between uh, Walton Gate and uh, Candlelit. But apart from that, 4,000 on average, two cars. They say one and a half, but I've never yet come across half a car. Well, this has been in an accident. And there's plenty of those going on at the moment, if you've noticed. The uptick, you know, I've lived here 30 years and I've never known so many accidents along the A14. And the hold ups and the gridlock, and the time it takes to get around. That's infrastructure, guys. And what did they say? Well, we'll build the estates and then we'll see what we have to do to mitigate. You can't mitigate once you've built the estates. And the, you know, the, I mean, the, the whole basis of this is that uh, um, sewage is another issue I'm going to quickly touch on. We've got a Victorian sewage system in this area. So when they start plugging all these estate houses into that Victorian sewage system, what's going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Ain't in water, we're going to pump it out into the Blinden Sea and in the River Demon and all the other rivers around it because they won't be able to cope with it. But according to East Suffolk Council, 
It's not a problem, the capacity's there. We know it isn't there. I spoke to an Anglian water engineer just a few months ago, and he said, you've got to be crazy. Anglian water haven't invested in their infrastructure for decades. The only thing they invest in is their profits for the executive bonuses. And that's coming from a 30-year Anglian water employee, so he should know what he's talking about. Anyway, so just quickly okay, finishing off, these are all go statements to the table. House of Commons, guys. That's it. The end says, farmland and greenfield sites should be protected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there, somebody made a comment not so long ago, um, this was nationally, said that a million houses could be built on brownfield land. Over a million houses could be built on brownfield. The developers do not want to do that, do they? Because they have to spend money to turn those brownfield sites into building sites. And they'd rather go on prime grade agricultural land, Howlett Way, it's prime grade two agricultural land. It takes, and Becker will explain this later on, a very, very long time to get the level of cultivation into the soil that we enjoy in this area. There is a world crisis coming about food security. The biggest existential threat to humanity, and this is not me talking, it's out there if you want to go and look for the research, is a lack of food. China is buying up farmland all over the world to feed its population. The other paragon of virtue, Bill Gates, his biggest investment portfolio now is farmland. Now these guys know what's coming down the road. So what happens? East Suffolk Council, with their infinite wisdom, with their head firmly planted in the sand, say, that's not a problem, we're covered in concrete. And we won't have to worry about farmland, will we? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's absolutely crazy what's gone on. So there were 100 Tory MPs who I pretty, I, I'm pretty sure they represented some blue uh, constituents around the country, and their constituents were coming from areas like Suffolk. And guess what, guys? They were getting a lot of flack from their constituents about what was going on with developments and planning on greenfield sites across those blue wall voters. And a hundred MPs threatened to rebel unless Gold introduced these measures into the planning framework. Now, I'm pretty sure that this could be a vote-catching exercise by the Tories, as their popularity plummets. They may be looking to kind of sweeten their core voting and come up with these things. One of the issues that we will need to talk about at some point is the fact that the local plan is approved. Okay, and, and I sat in on the local, I, I, I watched it on Zoom because it was during the pandemic period, I think, and I listened to the comments. The council is there, some of them said, I don't like this local plan, I'm not happy about it, but if we don't vote it in, then it's going to open up this area to speculative development. <coughs> so it's the lesser of two evils. Well, Gove is saying, you, local councils, can now reduce your housing numbers. You can set the numbers that you think are required for your local area. And if it takes time for you to do that, we're going to give you a period, and I think it was two years, to actually transition. But the problem is, that's for local plans that have yet to be approved. Now, back in 2019, I think it was, or 2018, there is a site, it's a government site, I can give you the link. They were chasing down the local authorities to get these local plans approved and pushed through. And nine out of 10 local authorities, as far as I'm aware, did that. So that means that if Gove puts these uh, proposals forward and they only apply to local plans that have not been approved, 90% of the local authorities are not going to be able to adjust their local plans according to what he's now putting in as the criteria. So that's the pressure point, that's what we've got to overcome and put something out there that creates enough noise 
that these people have to say we have to do something about current local plans. And it's no good talking about a five year review either. Because I tell you what, in five years, if these developers and landowners know that these changes are coming, guess what's going to happen? Every application will come through the floodgates and they'll push to get them all approved. I'm a great believer in coincidences. I don't think it's any coincidence that those esteemed academics at Trinity College with their friends Bidwells shoved this application for Howlett Way in now, in January, just a few weeks after Gove put this thing into the House of Commons. They know what's coming. So that's why we're here. What I'm going to do now is pass you over to Mike to explain how did we get here, what is the history behind this. Oh, sorry. Well, this is a book, a red book, believe it or not, um, which we kindly ask you to put your details in on the way out so that we can keep you. Or I'll pass it around, whatever. Um, and what is it? Address email or yeah, any email. contact? Thank you. Email address, telephone number. Yeah. The reason being that if any questions come up and you want to fire them into us, it gives us a time to come back to you with the answers. If you don't get the answers tonight, because we are pushed on time, yeah? Okay, Mike. Okay, Mike, here's the mic. Good evening. Um, can you hear that? Yeah. Bit loud, isn't it? On your lip. Um, I've only been resident here in the area for about 48 years. So I've grown old and grey here in Walton. That's where I live. I live in the original school that was built to deliver education to the Victorian kids in 1851. I feel probably the school provisioning that we are at, getting delivered in our town is pretty similar in take, looking by the number of kids that are actually taking their education outside of our town. Right, how did this start? Basically, and there's a lovely map here showing the choice that was made for the bypass and the access to the port way back in the 1970s. So that actually gives you Candlelit Road as the bypass and the A14 and the road down to the dock. And if you have a look at that map, you'll see that the southern end of it was infilled with Cavendish Park in Orwell Green some considerable time ago to meet the housing need that was perceived to be at that time. That was a particularly bad development because there wasn't any master plan for what the community would get out of that development, which is basically community assets. And what we've, all that's been happening here since I've lived here is a lot of the assets that were given to us by folks who lived here before us, such as the Bartlett, the Herman de Stern, and other facilities have actually been effectively given away with very little to replace those services to our community. So that really sets what might happen to our town into the future. What happened back, I think, in something like 2004, 2005, was we came up, or planning came up, with a system called the Blobs. And what they did, they gave a little red blob in different parts of our community, and Felix so was very lucky, it got five blobs of where development could be into the future. When that came, to a meeting of, the, of Felixstowe Town Council. A meeting was convened at the Walton Community Hall. There were, I believe, 130, 140 people locked outside because the hall was too small. The community really didn't have a voice, but in that meeting, we proposed from the floor that perhaps what we should be doing is looking to create a eco-village, which was at that time very popular uh, from a point of view of how we would save the planet and actually build appropriate and good homes. And that was actually approved by Felixstowe Town Council. Sadly, as often is the case, the District Council took a different view. So that never really proceeded. But then what happened, uh, some of you may have heard of an organisation called David Locke, and regional government at that time 
made something like £100,000 available for a specific study on Felixdale. And the concern at that time was we had two secondary schools, the old secondary modern and the grammar. That was Stephen and Orwell. And what they were concerned about was with the pre predicted population that we were going to have, there would be insufficient children to actually keep two secondary schools running. So they came in and they did a big study. Within that study, what David Locke said was that the area between Walton and uh, the lane behind it was deemed to be the green lungs of our peninsula. That was a place where people could go walk, ride their horses, cycle, etc., etc., and that had as much value as our seaside. So it got moved up the line as to how it should be looked. We then had a gentleman called um, John Prescott, who was a Deputy Prime Minister, and he was virtually Minister of Everything. And he was sort of doing this levelling up, and he and his uh, advisors decided that the existing local plan system failed to function quickly enough. So they developed a system which is this big tomb, which is full of a number of different chapters. And what they determined was that all you would need to do if you wanted to change a particular part of local policy is to actually just change that particular chapter. So it was going to be very quick, very efficient. The community, of course, would be consulted at great length and would be persuaded that what, what was being proposed would be good. Anyway, I think that started in something like 2004. And when I was left office in 2011, it still hadn't been <laughs> developed or accepted or achieved. It took an inordinate length of time to develop this local plan. But as I think has already been said, once that local plan is written in black and white, that effectively is the Bible as to what will happen to every piece and parcel of land within our district. And at that time, this was the Suffolk Coastal Plan. So, the first plan went in, and arising out of that plan was policy FPP7, and it says land off Howlett Way, Tripoli St. Martin. And what it says here, and, and this is one of the things that uh, I think we're referring to, it says 360 dwellings are expected on the site as a minimum. So there is no ma maximum indicated on that site. But then it comes forward with, and we've all encountered, haven't we, this promise that we're going to have affordable housing, and we've got to take the private housing to get the affordable housing which our indigenous population really needs because where are they going to live? A lot of them are having to move outside of the peninsula because the prices here are far too high, the rents are far too high. And anyway, that, that was the policy, FPP7, which was approved in the first local plan. There is an obligation on the authority to review the local plan periodically. So, needless to say, having got a local plan, they start reviewing it. So we then have a second local plan. And the area that was taken into account, some of you uh, may know Stennett's Farm, and it's been there for a very long time. And you may be aware that the developer, I think, called Christchurch Properties or similar, has expressed an interest in that quite some time ago. They put in an application, and that actually conflicted with the David Locke report that said that land area should be kept as a green space for us all to value. Anyway, they put in their application, it was refused. They reapplied, it was refused. They appealed to the inspectorate at Bristol, the planning inspectorate, it was refused. 
And then, lo and behold, Savit Javid, as minister at that time, he, they appealed to him and he approved it. Now, if you look at where Stenitz Farm is, what it actually does, it blows a hole through the hole of what I think the David Locke report was looking to preserve and keep. The district then suddenly saw an opportunity, if you like, to go all the way from Ferry Lane all the way up to the Curtain Roundabout and put land between Gopher Road and Candlet Road all the way through. And when you tot up the number of dwellings and you add in uh, St. Martin, you're actually more than 4,000 dwellings. Now that's a population add at 2.2 folk per house per dwelling of somewhere like 9,000 additional people coming into our town. Now today I went to the Integrated Care Board, which is the new body who's running all our health care, and they're supposed to be putting together the NHS and care provision, and I was able to uh, address the board with regards to the fact that we have three surgeries only now on the peninsula because Walton closed. Each of those surgeries are oversubscribed. There's something like 30,000 people, but we've, they've actually been obliged to take on 34,000 patients. So one of my objections will be that the infrastructure we have and, and what is predicted to be is totally inadequate to support the amount of building that is already proposed, already taking place, and which there will be more added to it. So I don't think there's a lot more else that I can add other than I've got a lovely picture here of the Archbishop of Canterbury and he says God is on his side in the battle for better housing. Now I think we all accept that we need housing but we need the right housing in the right place serving the need that we already have in the indigenous population granted you need to make some provision for incoming population, but we should be looking after our own first, and we've singularly failed to do that for virtually the last 15, 20 years. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mike. Now, I know we're running tight here, so I'm going to uh, ask if Rachel Smith-Light, the uh, Suffolk Green uh, District Councillor from Milton, who's uh, had a fair amount of experience in dealing with these issues, and uh, She's kind of joined us. Hi, everybody. Please don't throw things at me. I, I really hope I'm representing that awful council up the road. Um, no, it's um, there's, uh, just to give you a very quick uh, synopsis in case you don't know, um, there are five Greens out of 55 councillors, and there are 39 Conservatives. Uh, we've got May elections coming up, as you know. Yes, our political system is absolutely broken nationwide, it's appalling, it's a terrible state. We need PR, we need citizens' assemblies, we need lots of things. I think the revolution is coming, but it ain't here yet. So I'm gonna start by making a plea. Please talk to me afterwards if you're either interested, and I'm sorry if this is a shameless plug, but I do have to say it before we crack on, who, who would be uh, potentially interested in being a paper candidate for us in those May elections or at the very least helping us out, because we have to unseat so many more Tories if we are to get anything like a balance of power and anything like the change that we so desperately need. Myself and my colleague Vince here this evening, Vince is from Framley and he's gonna to talk to you in a minute. We're incensed about what's going on. I have two good friends over there from Grantsboro. It's really good to see you guys here tonight. They are having a terrible time in Grantsboro with the exact same problems that you're well, not exact on a slightly smaller scale, but nonetheless, terrible problems with overdevelopment in their village. And Christopher, nice to see you too. Uh, likewise, he's in my ward in Melton. And again, it's everywhere you go. It's everywhere you go, and it's nationwide. It's not just Suffolk, as I'm sure you really appreciate. Everywhere I go, our beautiful countryside and villages and communities are being absolutely ransacked uh, as a result, really, of the NPPF, the National Policy 
planning framework, appalling piece of legislation from 2013. Um, and, and we're seeing this now coming home to roost. Um, there are many awful developers. Hopkins Homes is one of them. They are, I, I can say this um, with absolute clarity, they are Tory, Tory party donors and they are not the only uh, housing uh, company, firm, construction firm to be so. So we are really up against it. Um, I have got with me this evening um, two copies of, and we will leave them here, I'm sorry it's only two, we didn't know that we were doing this until a few days ago, um, and we didn't know that we were going to be up here on a stage with a mic. We didn't think it was, there was going to be nearly so many people here. So we're really ill-prepared, and I apologise for that. But we did put together a um, Suffolk Coastal Green Party uh, briefing note on Howlett Way. So we'll leave these two documents here, grab them, uh, photocopy them or just read them or pass them around, or do whatever you want to do. Um, and I hope you find in there some of what you're looking for. I will just read um, the, the sort of the synopsis because it's about 10 or 11 pages, so I can't obviously go into it all now. Um, but just as, as I say, the summary. Green Party policy is clear that local communities should have much more influence over the allocation of sites for large-scale housing. There is clear democratic deficit in this case where even the applicants' own consultation summary records almost entirely negative responses. Um, our local Green Party draft housing policy is set out in Appendix 2, which is herein. Uh, this calls specifically for a pause in the approval of any new developments on greenfield sites in Felixstowe and the A14 corridor. It is completely consistent with this policy that we should support those in the affected communities who oppose the application on the Howlett Way site. One of the key policy differences we have with planning orthodoxy is that we do not believe that the current top-down method of assessing local housing need makes any sense. We conclude that the, the current annual target of 542 new homes in the Suffolk Coastal Local Plan is too high, but that the assessed need for 100 new affordable homes is too low. We believe it should be incumbent on the applicant and the planning authority to make a case for a need based on local survey work. It does not appear that this has been done in this case. If, despite the clear case against, this development does get approval, then other Green Party policies should apply, including our policy to accelerate the delivery of affordable housing by increasing the minimum proportion required in sites of 10 or more dwellings from a third to 50%. Our climate change policy should also apply, including a requirement in the design brief for low carbon design certifications such as passive house. Uh, which means solar on rooftops, low carbon heating systems, top grade insulation, etc., etc. Um, so we are, I think we import about 40% of our food into this country at the moment, which is crazy. It's completely unsustainable with wars and climate change and everything else. It's leaving us incredibly vulnerable. You're going to have to shut me up because I'm going to keep going. Otherwise, how long have I got? Five, okay. Um, so, yeah, um, we've got, it's, it's not just that, we've got a, a sort of very intensive agriculture, generally speaking as well, what I call an agri-desert, which isn't really doing us any favours either. Uh, we need to get away from mechanised uh, farm machinery, which is belching out CO2. We need really small CSAs, which are community-supported agriculture schemes, where people have much more involvement in their own agriculture and growing. Um, and that would be much more communal and social as well. Um, so it's been a bit of a disaster for nature and us. Um, but what the housing is just the concrete pouring is just obviously compounding the problems and making flooding worse. And of course it's easier for developers and cheaper for them to build on Greenbelt because quite often brownfield sites need decontamination and it costs money, doesn't it? So that's why they don't want to do it. Um, so I think... There isn't much more um, I wanted to say just at the moment because I've sort of blinded you with science. I'm kind of aware of that, but please ask me any questions if you would like to later on. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Vince, did you want to come up and have a quick? Yeah.
Vince has had some uh, experience of what we're experiencing in Framingham. Thank you very much. Um, I shared a document with you uh, today just to sort of outline the Framingham experience of, um, of actually trying to challenge East Suffolk Council on the Victorian Mills Road residence. Um, uh, there's an outline planning application which has recently been approved and uh, it, we did have manage to have it overturned because it's going to destroy an asset of community value, which is things like pubs and greens, um, and that's not allowed in the Suffolk plan. So, um, very quickly, 2017, our Framlingham neighbourhood plan was approved. It was written by um, a load of uh, Framlingham Town Council, unpaid volunteers, and it's a great document. It has green spaces, it has wildlife, it has footpaths, cycling paths. It has housing, because it has to have housing as part of the plan. And it also has um, renewable energy and sustainable energy. Now, I've become a green because my kids are so worried about climate change, and so am I. I'm increasingly, I, I was a Liberal Democrat, and I'm, in, I'm increasingly worried about what's happening and the way our governance is being led and done to us. So, neighbourhood plan was elected. It had 486 houses, which is in this document, which this gentleman very kindly provided. 486 houses for Framlingham by 2036. We're at 480 houses by 2022, and we've got yet more houses tabled by East Suffolk Council. Um, if some of these houses had had solar panels put on the roof, I calculate we would have had about 1.1 million kilowatts, and I'm not an electrician, but that sounds like a lot of kilowatts to me, um, that would have gone into Framlingham, and with a cost of living crisis, it's what everybody could have done with on their roofs right now. And why, at 1 to 2% of build cost, none of these houses have any of this renewable energy on the roof, it just seems like a huge shot in the foot to me. Um, the average price, it's supposed to be affordable housing. Okay. The average price of housing in Framlingham, according to Right Move, is £357,000. So with 480 new houses, that's the average price of a house in Fram. So I'm sure lots of Suffolk folks will um, be able to afford that. Um, the commercial areas gazetted in our plan, which I'm sure you have around here, but we had a commercial area. There's um, all these houses have been built, and the property developers are scrambling to build more houses. We have not a single small business invested in Framlingham on our commercial sites. No jobs, no nothing. My kids don't have any opportunity to stay, they would have to leave. But we got plenty of houses. Um, I'll, I'll just I've left this with you. Oh yes, Framlingham in 2006 won uh, an, a prize. It was Britain's best place to live. Um, I actually challenged East Suffolk Council whether we might actually win that again in the future. I find it highly unlikely. Um, let's have a look at some of the profits. Private sector housing. The construction inquirer stated that Persimmon Housing made an average of 66,000 profit per house built. So for 480 houses in Fram, we're looking at 32 million pounds as a minimum. I'd say it's closer to 40 to 50 million pounds. It's gone to shareholders and it's gone to CEOs. Um, the community investment levy for our town, paid by these developers, is 1.2 million pounds. Um, it just seems like David and Goliath uh, here. Sewage for this new site. Anglian Water states in their response, the foul drainage from this development is in the catchment of Framlingham Water Recycling Centre, which currently does not have the capacity to treat the flows from the development site. Yet, yet the, the building's going to go ahead. Um, one of the planners said in a meeting that uh, there was plenty of money for investment in infrastructure. I don't see it. Um, and I'd like him to clarify that. And are we going to be pouring raw sewage into the ore? Because Anglian Water has a great reputation for providing clean water. Um, this plan is going to take out an asset of community value. And our councillors, one of our councillors quoted that 
Framlingham just has to suck it up, which was, I, I found, a great statement by a councillor and very sensitive. Um, another one stated that um, the benefits outweigh the costs, so we're going to have this, this yet more housing. Um, there's been a lot of procedural, procedural inconsistencies in the planning process, in my view, and um, an example is that the latest application was a 253 page document, so it's a bit like this one, 253 pages that the, uh, the developers submitted, it did not have a table of contents. Now have you ever tried reading a document that thick without a table of contents? I'm sure our councillors are scrupulous and read things, but I'd have a pretty hard job reading that and understanding what the hell was going on in a document that size. When we try to challenge a large housing uh, development in Framlingham, our town council took it to judicial review and East Suffolk Council overturned that. Um, and one of the overturning things was that we didn't tick a box in the application in our judicial review. Now, this latest applicant has not ticked boxes, um, but they will not be overturned by our council. They will be allowed to go ahead. Um, all right, and I'll finish off, that's for Egypt. The, the applicant says that there are no recreational spaces. Uh, that within two to four minutes, there are three recreational spaces. There are recreational spaces. The road uh, that comes out of Victoria Mills Road is a single track road. Loads of people walk their dogs, go running, cycle their bikes, go there for their mental health and relaxation. These roads are turning into racetracks. And I don't see how we're going to be able to keep them as quiet lanes. Right, so we've got a lot of danger on some of these roads. I've just done a synopsis for you. Uh, everybody's willing to have a look at it. Just read it, it's only four pages, and it gives you some idea of some of the challenges that we face. We are not NIMBYs. We do accept that there is a need for affordable housing. But it's David against Goliath here, and they're taking the biscuit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vince. I just want to clarify some of you sitting here thinking, well, I thought this was about how it well, I thought it was about the truth. Is I want you guys to realise that this isn't isolated to us. This is going on all over the country, it's going on all around Suffolk. Now that's good because it means, for example, and there's Rupert, is Rupert in the house? I don't, I've never met him, so I don't, hi Rupert. Um, he's the leader of the Grunsborough group, which is similar to Cat Cat, but in Grunsborough. And I know he's been fighting a battle over there against developers with Hopkins Homes. The fact is that this is generic, this is endemic, it's representative of the fact that in Westminster nobody listens to the people and it cascades down to local government nobody listens to the people. I'm not here to do a party political thing, I don't care whether you're red, green, blue, pink, black, whatever. I'm only interested in protecting this area, Suffolk, which I came to, to raise my kids in because I wanted them to enjoy the environment, the landscape. We've just come through a pandemic, guys. One of the most important things that's come out of the science is that the landscape is so essential to our well-being and our mental health. <coughs> and I think most of you who were on, you know, gone through the pandemic probably went out and discovered parts of the landscape around here that you never knew existed. I know I did. And I felt very privileged to live here. I get really angry with what I see going on here. The corruption from Westminster, the, the lobbying by developers, the money that flows, the way that local budgets are cut, and then the government say, well, you can make it up if you approve houses. We'll give you a lump of cash every time you approve a new house. You can make your budgets up that way. That's fundamentally wrong. It's got to stop. But it ain't going to stop if we sit around and say, we can't do anything, can we? What can we do? That is what they want. They want to create apathy. Yeah? So that's just why I just wanted to put this into context why these good people here have come up. I'm not, I'm not a Green Party member, and, and Rachel asked me that question earlier, and I said I wasn't a Green Party member, I'm not a party member of any political party, I just want the right things done for the right reasons in the right places. 
I'm just going to quickly hand you over to Ian, who's going to you know, talk about a handout, because what we want this meeting to be is practical. We want you to go away with an idea of what you can say and who you can say it to. Um, this will be an ongoing process, so if you fill in the details on the book, as we get updated, we'll update you guys so you can even put in more comments. I'm going to a meeting of Rupert's on the 4th of February, I know a couple of other guys are, and that's, a, uh, I think I'm right in saying Rupert, is that about a local alliance of, yes. of community groups? This is the only way, this, yeah, this is the only way that these people at East Suffolk Council are going to sit up and have to listen. Because I remember being at a meeting at the town at, at Melton, at the, at the council, when they adopted the, not adopted the plan, but the draft of the plan, and Tony Fryer, who was a councillor there, there was a public ch uh, forum there as well, that were obviously voicing their opinions, <coughs> stood up and said, I don't care if there's a million of you out there that don't approve of this, it's going to make no difference. And that, to me, said everything about what's wrong with what's going on at the moment, yeah? Now, Michael Goh's comments are changing that fundamentally, and we have got to drag them screaming into that and incorporate that as they incorporated it before. And I'll just briefly, quickly finish by saying, in 2006, in the local plan, paragraph 11.4, general policies, Felix, though, anybody wants to go and dig that little chestnut up, it says, and I quote from Suffolk Coastal, any large-scale development on the Felixstowe Peninsula will damage the landscape character of the region, it will destroy high-grade agricultural land, and it will destroy wildlife habitats of national importance. Now I'm asking you, is that happening at the moment? Yes. Yeah? Is that what we're seeing going on here at the moment? And when I went to a planning meeting and spoke with Mark Edgerly, who was one of the senior planners, and said, I don't understand, Mark, 2006, these estates were going to destroy the landscape, and now you've got multiple estates in the local plan. So what's changed? Why are they not going to destroy the landscape now? And after a lot of kind of stargazing, he came back and said, well, its political will's changed. So in other words, they were dancing to the song of Westminster, even knowing that they were doing something which was going to damage this region, the region that they're elected to protect and look after and represent. And that to me is absolutely appalling. And they should be called to account for that. Well, I'll tell you what guys, political will is changing again. So if they incorporated it then, they can damn well incorporate it again, can't they? But they'll try and bury it, they'll try and say, the plan's adopted, we can't do anything about it. You've got to be We've got to be on that argument, and we'll tell you how we can get on that argument later. But I'm just going to push over to him quickly. Oh, I'm going to push you back up. Let's just go and do the. Um, I usually sing it sometimes, just put a little song in for a minute. Um, Becca's going to talk about the importance of what we're losing here in terms of our agricultural land and wildlife. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you to everybody for coming. It's, um, a really encouraging turnout. Um, I'm going to talk about why I think we should protect our farmland soil. As we know, rural Trimley, Walton and Felixstowe is disappearing fast. The heart is being ripped out of it, despite many, many, many injections, objections from local people and parish councils. And it's very alarming to see how much precious soil is being covered in concrete. It's clear to all of us that live here that live here that the high road has become terribly busy. It simply can't cope with hundreds of new houses and the huge increase in traffic. It's struggling. Double parking doesn't help. A few days ago I was talking to a gentleman who was walking his dog and um, he lives on the high road. He parks on the high road. His first car was written off. His replacement car is now in the garage, having been hit again. Also, if you live in any of the lanes that join onto the high road, you'll know you literally take your life in your hands to get onto the high road because of the new builds. There are now apparently well, 700 more cars daily using this road, and the noise and the pollution is increasing. 
I would like to briefly focus on an area that doesn't get mentioned much, our neighbours of the wildlife kind. At the inspector's hearing in August 2019, which related to Innocence Farm, our campaign attended that, and right at the end, I asked the inspector if I could pose a quick question to the Trinity College Cambridge barrister. Yes, I could. I asked this gentleman if a wildlife survey had been carried out in the area's market development. No answer, a lot of shuffling of papers and a bit of a red face. The inspector said he would expect that to be carried out as a matter of course. Sadly, we are one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. One in seven of our native species face extinction. More than 40% are in decline. Hedgehog numbers have plummeted by half since 2000. Our garden habitats are increasingly wildlife unfriendly, paving and astroturf lawns becoming commonplace. I'm fortunate enough to have two wildlife cameras. We've lived here for almost 20 years, but I haven't seen a badger for three years. The monk jack and roe deer that occasionally popped in don't anymore and there are no hedgehog families either. With the obliteration of our fields, creatures are finding it harder and harder to survive. Working beneath us in the soil is the lowly earthworm. They are our underground allies. They help prevent flooding by creating masses of tunnels. They eat dead and decaying organic matter, and without them, scientists say that life would vanish pretty quickly. We'd have less food, more pollution, and more flooding. These engineers of the soil are our planet's saviors. They are also a vital food source for many creatures. And so to soil, which we are covering in concrete pretty quickly, shoving thousands of homes up <coughs> on our fields. We have some of the best farmland soil in the country, the highest grades. It takes at least over a century for this valuable soil, grade one and grade two, to form. It can take a thousand years for just an inch of fertile soil to store, form from scratch. To cover it in concrete is like taking food from our mouths. Ukraine, a country that supplies so many of the key basics for our food, is facing a nightmare. It really is time to protect our own farmland we must become more self-sufficient in food production. Research shows that topsoil eradication can become a serious ecological problem, a concern, a disaster waiting to happen. Surely our council planners realize all these factors? It's time to try and save our food producing soil and support our farmers. High grade soil is becoming increasingly scarce. According to the internet, as we heard, Bill Gates has bought farmland acres roughly the size of Hong Kong, so he must think it's important, and China buying farmland up worldwide because it wants to feed their increasing population. So why are we covering up one of our most precious assets? Greed, lack of knowledge, or just basic couldn't care less attitude? So please, Make your voices loud to planners. Save our soil for our children and our children's children. for the wonderful place that we live in here. And really, for what has been presented with uh, how it's working, we have got to really, in numbers, a 
object to what is taking place? What does it mean to you? What do you feel? What do you sorry? What, what do what do you feel when you walk when you walk around when you walk around Trinity St Martin? Not only recently, but in the past. And how is that going to change when this new development should it be approved? Go ahead. What it effectively will mean is the enclosure of Trimley St Martin as a village. It will not be the same. It will not be the same again. Now, what we're urging you to do is speak to your neighbours, your friends, relatives who live in the area, who also feel much the same as you, and urge them to object to what is taking place. The handout that you have before you just gives an indication of the process to follow and also what are the material considerations for objecting. And if you are able to provide some tangible evidence of what you see, what you feel, what is going to change as a consequence of these developments, put it down, put it, put it in. With poppy fields, the lilacs, reef lodge, and also Howlett Way, we'll produce somewhere in the region of about another 800 vehicles. Can the high road accommodate that? We've already heard about how people are having to jump aside for vehicles coming by, the, near, the number of accidents, cyclists who are going on the pavement and uh, just not observing the cycle tracks, and certainly just at the pinch point by, uh, by the uh, church lane. It is an absolute, it's, it's, a, it's very, very bad, and the, the fact that accidents haven't happened thus far is very, very fortunate. When cars park on both sides of the road, that is where it's, it's going to cause real problems. And when the school goes ahead and is built, there's going to be many youngsters, mums with push chairs, making their way to the shop because that's where all the kids will want to go. So on the on the back of the uh, of the document there, it will just illustrates really the process to follow and go into the the planning website, the reference number, state that you object, and also there's a list of all the runners and riders at. Uh, Slightly Suffolk Council, which includes members of the planning committee, senior members, write to them. Give them a copy of what you're, what you're sending. So they're in no doubt of the depth of feeling there is around here as to what is going to take place. And it may shake them up a wee bit and realise if they receive a volume of objections because they will also get copies of this later when, the, uh, when, they, de when they decide on whether it's going to appro be approved or not. I'll just ask if there have been two applications on the site. As far as I'm aware, they haven't. Something of what? We have this in Brunsborough? Yes, sorry. Two applications. So we have to object to different applications on the same site, which meant a lot of people only objected to one. Missed the other one? Yeah, this is just a, this is just an outline application. The first one went in in 2018, May 2018, and at that time they were looking to um, build, I think, 240 houses. In the intervening period, there was uh, there's been a, a number of consultees, and this recent application, which is an updated version, they have also indicated, taken a, a note of consultees, they've kindly reduced the number to 200, sorry, 310 houses, and they're going to, they're looking to provide a dedicated dog walking area, which some of you will be delighted with, and, and also the one positive thing that I have seen is indication about a level crossing between the mariners and the shop which I, I, think, I think would be very beneficial. But that is, in my view, that, that is the only positive thing that is, that, that is there. So I would, urge, I would urge you to send your applications in. Yes, the date is the uh, 1st of February, 
but many councils, and I think East Suffolk may be the same, will continue to continue to accept um, submissions following after the first, but not when the uh, obviously when the uh, decision has been determined, which is likely to be a couple of months or so. So please do so, do write in, do send in your objections, and please ask your friends, neighbours, relatives to do, to do the same. The sheer volume of objections will certainly give a sort of a shot across the bowels of the depth of feeling around. Thank you very much. I think the darts are going to start flying very shortly. Um, what I wanted to just quickly add, a couple of things. One is that um, if enough of you want another get-together to go over this in more detail, then we're quite happy to arrange that. You can reach out to us on our website. You can reach out to us on our Facebook group. Does everybody know where we are on Facebook. I mean, if you just look for Catcade on Facebook, it will be Kirtland and Trimley Community Association, it will pop up and you can leave messages for us. If you filled in the book, we can reach out to you as well. What I want to just quickly add on top of what's been said about this is that there's two elements to comments. One is the what they call the material planning considerations which are the ones the planners get all comfortable about because they've dictated what they can be and what they can't be. So that needs to be done. But also, I would like to ask you all to look at... You got the leaflet? Did everybody get the leaflet? Have you still got copies? Yeah, on that leaflet, we outlined a number of comments that Gove had made about um, this change in planning policy. I would like you to say something along the lines of, in consideration of Michael Gove's letter to the House of Commons in December 22, we respectfully ask you to review the local plan and pause it to ascertain its soundness in relation to those comments. Yeah? So that's all you have to say. Now, Chris Bally, I think if that's his name, yeah, Bally, Bally, Bally. He's the new Chief Executive Officer of East Suffolk Coastal East Suffolk Council. And he lives in, God bless him, Felixstowe. Yeah? So he's in the middle of the storm. Now, he came from Suffolk County Council, so I'm assuming he wasn't part of the inner circle at East Suffolk when they made the decisions about this local plan. So he might not be as committed to it as the other guys were who were involved in pushing it through. So I think if enough of us, his email address is on here, send that message to him, not only about how it weighed and and the, and the, and you know the fact that it's not acceptable the reasons that we've spoken about, but just mention I want these guys to know that you guys know what's going down in Westminster. Yeah? I want you to tell them that you expect them, in their capacity as your representatives, to ensure that this current local plan is sound going forward. Because this lasts until 2036, and it will be reviewed every five years. Right? I was at the inspector's hearing when one of the one of the uh, councillors or one of the Suffolk uh, planners or whatever said, "Yeah, well, we'll review it every five years." But you know what? It was added that the only way they're going to review it is if they want to build more houses. So there wasn't anything about reducing housing numbers, it was all about increasing them. So I fall into this trap that the review is going to be a way to get all snuggling with the local plan and make it right and proper. Within five years' time, we're dead and dusty. These, these builders, these developers will be all over us like a rash in that five year period. We've got to go now as a group and, and hopefully in other areas and say we demand that this plan is reviewed in the context of these are too significant these changes they're material they're substantive they have to be taken into account all right thank you so much for coming 
really pleased that so many of you came out tonight. Lisa, I understand what I understand what you're saying, but really they have to be individual. The letters need to be individual. If you've got the, if you've got like, you know, you just mentioned, can you say this, this, and this? A framework. You've got you've got you've got you've got these subject matters, the, the material considerations, and it's to use that and use that as the headings, and then. You, you, you express your own your own uh, thoughts around what they mean to you and how that's going to change. They have to be individual. If it is a if it is a template, they pick it up very very quickly and it gets discounted. And that, that's 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 the problem. Can you pop this one on the file so we can share it with neighbours? Yes. This, so we've got the emails. That'll be really yes, I'll, I'll, I will send that out to get together with. The documents from the Green Party and and also and also also Grunsborough. If I was just to quickly ask you now, how many of you would like a further get together on this before the submission date? Yeah. 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 Yeah